The Crystal Gems have been through a lot, and now after five seasons, a movie, and an epilogue series, it's all finally come to a close. We gave you a timeline a little while ago, but with the end of the series, what better time for a refresher on all things Homeworld, Beach City, and everything in between? I'm Jacob with Channel Frederator, and we're about to take a journey across different planets and warp pads in this newly updated timeline of Rebecca Sugar's Steven Universe. Quick side note, the Steven Universe canon has extended beyond animation and into comics and video games, and these events, called the Level 2 canon, are considered to be a part of the timeline, unless the show contradicts them. But for the sake of simplicity, and because these comics and games exist in relatively self-contained stories, we won't be including them in this video. We'll also be avoiding non-canon material, so no say uncle either, which is what I'm assuming that disclaimer was meant for exclusively. Last thing, since Steven is the main driving force of the series, we'll be using him as the central point for the entire timeline. Therefore, anything taking place before his birth will be referred to as BS or before Steven. And yes, haha, BS, very funny, pause for laughter. <laughs> Glad we got that out of our system. With that, the Diamond Authority begins. I don't know when this happens, time is a construct. Way before any sort of recorded history in the timeline of the series, some important events took place that laid all the groundwork for what's to come. It's unknown just exactly how she comes into existence, but nevertheless, White Diamond appears out of nowhere eons ago. She's presumably the first gem to exist, and she gives herself the task to construct all of Homeworld society, namely a caste system that puts the diamonds at the top and other gems like pearls and rubies at the bottom, acting as servants and bodyguards, respectively. How convenient for White. At this time, cross-gem fusions are banned alongside off-color gems like the Rutile Twins. With her fellow diamonds, yellow, blue, and the runt of little importance, pink, White creates the Diamond Authority and begins to spread their empire across all of space, colonizing planets to create even more gems. They take over a total of 43 planetary bodies and two whole solar systems to terraform in their own image. While White, Yellow, and Blue were expanding the empire, itty bitty little pink diamond was given a friend to keep her company, Spinel. The two would play games for hours in Pink's garden, but eventually Pink outgrows Spinel and deals with its super maturely, but we'll get to that. During the colonization of the Jungle Moon, a celestial body first seen in the episode, well, Jungle Moon, Pink Diamond demands her own colony from Yellow Diamond, but is turned down. Around this time, Pink Diamond becomes super rebellious, slashing out at her fellow diamonds and any other gems that happen to be nearby. Pink Diamond colonizes Earth, around 10,000 to 6,000 BS. After her original Pink Pearl has a <coughs> unfortunate accident, I hope you can hear those quotation marks, Pink is given a new pearl, the one that we all know and love in the main series. Instead of goofing off with Pink and getting into mischief like the previous pearl, this pearl was made to be more proper and reserved with her diamond, but of course, that won't last long. After enough begging, Yellow and Blue Diamond finally allow Pink to control her own colony, some nowhere planet named Yarth or something like that. Excited to start her new life on Earth, Pink abandons Spinel in her garden, asking Spinel to play a game where she must stand very still. The impressionable Spinel obliges while Pink leaves her behind, and the Jester Gem continues to take the game very seriously, like standing still for 6,000 years seriously. Uh, we'll check on her after a hot minute and see how she's doing. The Prime Kindergarten is created on Earth with the sole purpose of creating more and more gems and a base is built on the moon so that Pink can easily monitor the creation of these gems. Colonization on Earth is in full swing. The Lunar Sea Spire, Communication Hub, Sky Spire, and Sea Shrine are all constructed during this time. Gems from Homeworld are sent in droves to help out on Earth with one of these ships bringing along Nephrite. Nephrite has a bit of a rough go at it. Uh, we'll, ch we'll check on her later too. So Pink finally got got what she wanted, a colony of her very own, but she still finds herself bored. That is, until she sees how much fun the Quartz soldiers that just popped out of the kindergarten are having. She desperately wants to join in, but knows she'll get an earful from Yellow and Blue if she goes playing around with lesser gems. So Pearl makes an offhand comment about how she could disguise herself as a Rose Quartz to fit in, and of course Pink takes that idea and runs with it, shapeshifting into a Rose Quartz soldier. Gems can shapeshift, by the way. During her time as Rose Quartz, Pink finds life on Earth to be so beautiful beautiful that she begins to reflect on what exactly it is they're doing. Colonizing and terraforming Earth will cause the destruction of all natural life on the planet, so she decides to take a heroic stand, one that Yellow and Blue will absolutely understand and agree with because that's absolutely what they'll think based on everything we know about them so far. Uh, yeah, instead we get the whole big sister, little sister spiel with Yellow scolding her to finish what she started and Blue completely misunderstanding Pink's intentions and creating a human zoo in order to preserve life by, you know, kidnapping people and dragging them away from their families to live in a glorified space prison for the rest of their lives and further generations inadvertently creating a culture all of its own. That's a lot to unpack there just then, oh boy. 
the Crystal Gems form, around 5700 BS. Attempt after attempt to convince the other diamonds to give up the colonization plans goes nowhere. Pink Diamond finally decides to take a stand against the Diamond Authority. Pink, still secretly disguised as Rose Quartz, and Pearl defect from Homeworld and form the Crystal Gems, a band of rebel gems fighting against the Diamond's colonization schemes. From here on out, we'll be referring to Pink Diamond as Rose Quartz when in this form, and as Pink Diamond for when she's in her true form, which won't happen very much starting now. With the rebellion growing larger and larger by the day, Blue Diamond and the members of her court arrive on Earth to put a stop to these rebels before things get out of hand. Among the members of this court are a Sapphire, an aristocratic gem who can see into the future, along with three ruby guards to escort her. Out of nowhere, Rose Quartz and Pearl attack Blue Diamond's court. In all the confusion, one of the rubies and the Sapphire accidentally fuse together for the first time, becoming Garnet. The entire court is disgusted by their fusion, and the two are outcast on Earth, isolated from the rest of Gem society. Ruby and Sapphire, now alone with each other in the wilderness, begin to form a bond and slowly fall in love to the point where they fuse into Garnet on purpose, though Garnet is a mess of confusion and wonderment as soon as she's formed. Rose, fascinated by how two different gems were able to fuse, recruits the newly formed Garnet into the Crystal Gems, telling them that they should never question whether who they are is right, welcome to Earth, etc. After seeing the beauty that both Earth and Gem society has to offer, Pink makes one final attempt to convince the Diamonds to end the colonization of Earth, but they ignore her once again, obviously. So this time, she decides to make them listen. The Gem War, around 5000 BS. A thousand year war begins, known as the Rebellion or the Gem War, depending on who you ask. Countless battles are waged across Earth with heavy casualties on both sides. During the war, the Crystal Gems numbers grow exponentially, allowing them to hold their own against homeworld forces with relative ease. Among these new recruits are Bismuth, Ocean Jasper, Snowflake Obsidian, Biggs Jasper, and many others. An absolute abundance of characters that we, do, uh, we, we don't really get to know most of them. With the recruit of Bismuth, though, the forge is created, allowing an endless supply of awesome weapons for the Crystal Gems. Among them is Rose's iconic huge pink sword. Around this time, a lapis lazuli visits Earth during the colonization, but is caught up in the war and ends up getting poofed by Bismuth, a condition where a gem loses their physical form and their gem lies dormant until they're able to regenerate with a sweet new visual design, Doctor Who style. Homeworld gems come across Lapis's gemstone and, believing her to be a member of the Crystal Gems, trap her inside of a mirror to interrogate her. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, I that's not fair, what about justice? Well, as you'll see, uh, concepts like that aren't uh, aren't really the diamond's bag. With her poofing gems left and right and beginning to create more and more dangerous weapons, Bismuth starts to become a problem for Rose Quartz. With the creation of the Breaking Point, a weapon designed to shatter gems, which is significantly worse than just, you know, destroying their physical form, Rose determines that Bismuth has become a liability and poofs her, trapping her in a bubble and keeping her hidden from the rest of the crystal gems. It's assumed they're just told that Bismuth was one of the many casualties of war. As the war grows more intense by the day, Homeworld becomes desperate for more soldiers to add to their army, and thus creates the Beta Kindergarten, a kindergarten specifically meant to pump out more Quartz soldiers as quickly as possible. It's definitely a quantity over quality situation, and the Diamonds clearly chose quantity, since most of the Quartz soldiers that came from the Kindergarten end up being deformed. But among the deformed is Jasper, who is an absolute unit, way bigger than a normal Quartz. Rumor has it that she took out 80 Crystal Gems on her first day. With a never-ending supply of soldiers, it begins to feel like the war could be endless. Remember how we said Pink Diamond would make the other diamonds listen? Uh, yeah, so it's time to talk about that. Uh, and you know what I'm talking about, the launch of countless theories and head cannons. After who knows how many attempts to reason with Yellow and Blue Diamond, Pink Diamond decides to take drastic measures to finally end this war. Along with Pearl, the two plan to stage the shattering of Pink Diamond at the hands of Rose Quartz. Pearl, shapeshifting into Rose Quartz, uses Rose's sword to poof Pink, who had swallowed some fake gem shards, giving off the illusion that she had been shattered. From this point onward, Pink Diamond is no more and permanently goes by Rose Quartz in both name and appearance. Appearance. The Diamonds are absolutely devastated at the loss of Pink. As a result of her alleged shattering, Homeworld enters a depression era and resources begin to run low. Earth is finally deemed non-viable and all plans to continue colonization are abandoned. A few battles take place afterwards, specifically one at the Strawberry Battlefield where Rose loses her scabbard, but for the most part the war is over. Keen to not let all their efforts go to waste though, the Diamond Authority still decides that Earth is of some use to them, namely testing forced fusion on the shattered remains of Crystal Gems as a cruel form of punishment. The cluster is the result of one of these experiments, and is placed at the center of the Earth to suffer for centuries. That's like some I have no mouth and I must scream levels of torture. 
now that I think about it. The Aftermath, around 4000 BS. As the Great Gem War begins to die down, homeworld gems are ordered to evacuate, leaving many of their own kind behind, like Nephrite and her crew, as well as Lapis Lazuli's mirror. In order to tie up all the loose ends on Earth, the diamonds send out a massive flash of light and song in an attempt to eradicate all gems from Earth, including all rebel and homeworld soldiers. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite have the effect that they wanted. Instead of destroying the gems remaining on Earth, it actually corrupts them. This causes a gem to take on a hideous, monstrous form, losing all signs of humanity and intelligence, becoming a mindless beast. Thankfully, Rose is able to put up a massive shield just in time, protecting herself, Pearl, and Garnet from being corrupted. The only other gems that are able to survive the corruption are Bismuth, who's still trapped in a bubble, and Lapis Lazuli, who was in the mirror at the time. With their forces reduced to a mere three members, and sometimes four when Ruby and Sapphire are unfused, the crystal gems begin to lie low, cleaning up and bubbling whatever corrupted gem monsters were left behind after the war. About 500 years after the war, the amethyst that we all know and love finally pops out of the prime kindergarten just a bit overcooked. And by a bit, we mean she's really, really tiny. The Crystal Gems come across her and recruit her. With all four members together, the Crystal Gems construct the Crystal Temple near the outskirts of what would eventually become Beach City. Back on homeworld, resources have continued to run low. This causes many of the gems created during Era 2 to be smaller than usual. As a result, they need to use technology like limb enhancers to compensate for their smaller stature. One of the gems created during this era is Peridot. More on her later. Beach City established around 200 BS. Now let's take a huge jump forward in time. In the 19th century, Captain William Dewey, his first mate Buddy Budwick, and their crew travel across the ocean in search of new land. While out at sea, their ship is attacked by a vicious corrupted gem. When all hope seems lost, they're rescued by a massive gem known as Obsidian, which is a fusion between Rose Quartz, Pearl, Garnet, and Amethyst. William Dewey becomes friends with the Crystal Gems and settles in an area nearby, establishing Beach City. It's a very creative name, Captain Dewey. That must have taking you literal seconds. At this point, Buddy Budwick decides to venture out on his own to become an explorer and author. He visits many iconic locations from the Gem War, like the Strawberry Battlefield and the Beta Kindergarten while transcribing his findings. He eventually ends up in the desert where he meets Rose Quartz and her pack of lions. I don't think I mentioned that Rose had lions before, but she did. It's pretty rad. Sadly, one of Rose's lions eventually passes away, but she decides that she's having none of that and resurrects him with her healing powers. The lion is reborn with pink fur and an even pinker mane, now blessed with a much longer lifespan and a strange crack in space-time within his mane. Rose uses this pocket dimension inside the lion's mane to start storing sentimental and important artifacts, including Bismuth's bubbled gem. She keeps this a secret from the rest of the crystal gems. Boy Meets Gem, around 10 BS or the, the 1990s. Let's take another big leap forward in time and follow the story of Greg DeMeo, a young man who drops out of community college around this time to follow his dream to become a rock star. Inspired by his favorite song by the artist Carrie Moon, Moonbeam, Greg DeMeo changes his name to Greg Universe and buys a van which becomes his home. Greg ends up signing a deal with the scummy manager and travels around the state performing shows that nobody shows up to. Well, except for one person, one gem, Rose Quartz. Greg falls in love with Rose and decides to stay in Beach City, cutting off all ties to his manager. The two settle down together and Greg starts a job at the It's a Wash car wash, eventually becoming its owner. Steven is born around 2000. In the year 2000, Steven Quartz Universe is born to Greg Universe and Rose Quartz. Given the unique nature of his heritage, Rose must give up her physical form in order for Steven to exist, causing him to gain her gemstone in his belly button. Rose's absence is felt tremendously by both Greg and the Crystal Gems, but all four of them agree to raise Steven together. Steven grows up living mostly with his father in the van, but the Gems are still heavily involved in his early life, though Steven never sees the comforts of a normal upbringing like school or doctors or anything like that. Around 2012, a beach house is added to the Crystal Temple as a place for Steven to live. One year later, when Steven turns 13, he moves into the beach house and finally starts his journey to follow in his mother's footsteps and becomes one of the Crystal Gems. Around this time, Steven unofficially meets Connie Maheshwarin for the first time at the Beach City Boardwalk Parade. When he picks up the glow stick bracelet that she had dropped, he keeps it in the freezer so it'll stay glowing, just in case he runs into her again. Season 1, around 13 AS or 2013. We finally made it to the start of the series and it only took over 10,000 years. Since Steven has been born now, we'll be referring to these years as AS or after after Steven. Given how relatively short the series is compared to its history, though, this probably won't be coming up much. All right, on to season one, which began airing in our 2013 and takes place in their 2013. Nice. Steven is now in the full swing of his training, though he's still treated like a little kid by the other Crystal Gems. It's understandable given his 
love for things like Dogcopter and Cookie Cats, though. A lot happens in Steven's first year of being an official Crystal Gem. A homeworld surveillance vessel known as a Red Eye appears, ending a 4,000 year long absence of homeworld interest in Earth. Using his mother's laser light cannon, along with ancient sage hot dog wisdom from his father, Steven is able to destroy the Red Eye. While Earth is safe for a bit, homeworld is tipped off to the existence of Crystal Gems that survived all those years ago. During a mission in the desert, Steven discovers the lion that Rose had revived so long ago, still alive and kicking. The two become fast friends and Lion joins the Crystal Gems. Soon, Steven discovers Rose's secret armory, as well as the pocket dimension inside Lion's mane. Steven also officially meets Connie around this time, and the two begin hanging out and getting into all sorts of adorable magical shenanigans. During this year, Steven also inadvertently releases Lapis Lazuli from her mirror prison, causing her to lash out against the Crystal Gems and steal the entire Earth's ocean in her attempt to get her back to homeworld. I feel like that might have had some off-screen repercussions that we never uh, saw. I mean, I feel like that would change a lot about Earth if the ocean just disappeared all of a sudden, even if it came back. Whatever, Steven helps her and she leaves Earth and its oceans alone. A few other notable events happen during this year, like when Steven forms an army of sentient watermelon Stevens. Yeah, it's exactly how it sounds. They'll come back later. They will. Or when Steven and Connie fuse into Stevani, proving that humans and gems can indeed fuse together. Or humans and half-human, half-gem hybrids, at least. Steven also encounters Peridot, who arrives on Earth on a scouting mission after the Red Eye detected gem activity. Some cat and mouse with the homeworld gem ensues until Steven meets her face to face and aimlessly tells her about some of his friends in Beach City. Some valuable intel, I'm sure. Shortly after, Earth is invaded by a small fleet of homeworld gems, led by the mighty Jasper from the Beta Kindergarten, Peridot, and a freshly captured Lapis Lazuli, the same one as before, of course. Beach City is evacuated and Steven learns about the Gem War. Jasper forces Garnet apart and captures the Crystal Gems. On the Gem Warship, Steven learns of Ruby, Sapphire, and their fusion for the first time, and together they're able to defeat Jasper and destroy the warship. Peridot manages to escape and Lapis and Jasper fuse into Malachite to destroy the gems. But it's a trap! Lapis uses this fusion as a chance to drag Jasper to the bottom of the ocean with her, the two of them locked in a stalemate fusion type deal. The Crystal Gems take a breather and think this might be a good time to go on hiatus or something. Season 2, around 14 AS or 2014, and get used to me saying 14 AS a lot. Moving right along to Season 2, which premiered literally the day after Season 1, the citizens of Beach City begin to rebuild after the damage caused by the Gem Warship. Wanting to help Steven in his upcoming fights against Homeworld, Connie takes up sword fighting lessons from Pearl. With Peridot on the loose, the Gems begin tracking her down so that she can't contact Homeworld or escape. During one of their missions to catch her, they discover the existence of the forced fusion experiments. After Steven captures and befriends Peridot, because he's Steven, she reveals the existence of the Cluster, the massive forced fusion in the center of the Earth that's basically a ticking time bomb. If it's not dealt with quickly, its reformation could destroy the entire Earth. With the help of Peridot, the Crystal Gems begin to build a machine that can travel deep into the Earth's core and take on the Cluster. During all this chaos, Steven has his 14th birthday. Eventually, Peridot is able to contact Homeworld, but instead of betraying the Gems, she betrays Homeworld and defects, becoming an official member of the Crystal Gems. She'll eventually adopt a star for her uniform, but, like, later. So am I gonna have to wear a star? Where am I gonna put the star? Season 3, still 14 AS or 2014. On the day of the Cluster's reformation, the Crystal Gems split up into two groups, Steven and Peridot in one, and Garnet, Amethyst, and Pearl in the other. While Steven and Peridot travel to the center of the Earth to confront the Cluster, the other Crystal Gems travel to Watermelon Island. Yeah, remember the sentient watermelons that Steven created? Well, they kinda sorta started their own civilization and Steven can telepathically communicate with them. It, it makes more sense in the show, maybe? No? Anyway, Malachite is spotted on Watermelon Island, so the Crystal Gems head there, defeat Malachite, and rescue Lapis Lazuli while Jasper gets away. Meanwhile, Steven and Peridot are able to successfully neutralize the cluster and seal it safely within a bubble. With the threat behind them and with new friends along for the journey, Steven helps Lapis adjust to life on Earth by having her move into the barn with Peridot. What season is that? Three. After some casual adventures in Beach City and a short period of peace, Jasper returns with an army of corrupted gem monsters. At the Beta Kindergarten, Steven, Amethyst, and Peridot confront Jasper, who attempts to fuse with a corrupted gem. Steven and Amethyst fuse in turn, creating Smoky Quartz, who proceeds to kick Jasper's ass with a yo-yo. Jasper is poofed and bubbled, ending her reign of terror for good. Around this time, Steven discovers Bismuth's bubble gem inside Lion's mane and accidentally releases her. They start to get along, but Steven soon realizes why his mother sealed her away in the first place, and 
eventually must do the same himself. Later, a group of rubies arrive on Earth searching for Jasper. Stephen learns that his mother shattered Pink Diamond, unaware of Rose Quartz's true identity. Shortly after, he and one of the homeworld rubies, which has her gem in her eyeball, which seems uncomfortable, become trapped in a space bubble. Well, at least until he's saved by the crystal gems and brought back to Earth. Eyeball is not brought back to Earth, she's just left to float through space. <laughs> Oh well, guess we'll never see her again. Season 4, still 14 AS or 2014. It's uh, been a long year for Steven. After some strange dreams resulting in giant Studio Ghibli-esque tears, Steven and Greg travel to Korea to confront the source of his dream, Blue Diamond, grieving at the spot where Pink was shattered. Blue abducts Greg and takes him to the human zoo that once belonged to Pink. The Crystal Gems travel to the zoo in order to rescue him. They discover a whole society of humans living there who descended from the first captives thousands of years ago. While at the zoo, Steven catches a glimpse of both Yellow and Blue Diamond in person for the first time, and they are massive. Back on Earth, residents start mysteriously going missing. They also just happen to be the same people that Steven told Peridot about all that time ago when they met for the first time. Hmm. It turns out that a gem named Aquamarine has been using that intel to steal them and take them to the zoo. In an attempt to save his friends, Steven reveals his mother's gemstone, leading Aquamarine to believe that Steven and Rose Quartz are the same person, since, you know, human reproduction is kind of a weird concept for gems. She captures Steven and takes him to Homeworld, with his friend Lars accidentally stowed away on the ship. Season 5, still 14 AS or 2014. This is the last one, though. This is the last time we're in year 14. While on the Homeworld ship, Steven discovers that Lars is still on board. The two are brought to Homeworld, and Steven is put on trial for Rose Quartz's war crimes. During this trial, Steven learns that his mother might not actually be responsible for the shattering of Pink Diamond thanks to the lateral thinking provided by a Zircon defense attorney. When this speculation is laid out instead of rushing through the trial for a hasty execution, Yellow Diamond poofs both attorneys, chaos breaks out, and Steven and Lars escape in the heat of the moment. They find themselves in the depths of Homeworld, where they meet some rogue off-color gems who have been living and hiding for eons. Unfortunately, they're pursued by Robonoids, and Lars is killed in an explosion. Though all hope seems lost, Lars is revived through the inherited healing factor of Steven's tears, giving him a pink appearance similar to Lion's. The newly revived Lars discovers that his hair contains the same pocket dimension as Lion, which Steven uses to get back home and find help to rescue Lars. Lapis, fearing the diamonds, leaves Earth and takes the barn with her, abandoning the crystal gems and Peridot. Meanwhile in space, Lars and the off-colors become well acquainted with each other. They steal a homeworld ship and start exploring the cosmos together. Steven and Connie as Stevani visit Lars through his pocket dimension, but eventually find themselves stuck on the jungle moon where they learn more about Pink Diamond's past. Through Pearl, Steven finally uncovers the truth about his mother. She was Pink Diamond all along. Pause for dramatic sting. What a reveal that we all kind of already had the feeling of. It takes a bit, though, for Garnet and Amethyst to actually accept this, but eventually they come around to it. With this newfound purpose and understanding, Ruby and Sapphire decide to get married. Steven wants to give Bismuth another chance for the wedding, and through the power of forgiveness, they add another crystal gem to their group. Unfortunately, the wedding is crashed, literally, by the diamonds. Thankfully, Lapis crashes their wedding crash with her own crash, bringing the entire barn down on the diamonds. She then officially joins the crystal gems, which was just such a an awesome scene. I've felt worse. But the diamonds fight back, and when all hope seems lost, I've been saying that a lot lately, Steven uses an out-of-body experience to show them who he really is, Pink Diamond. This wins over the diamonds, and Blue and Yellow finally end their attack. With the help of the diamonds, Steven hopes to uncorrupt the gems that were affected by the diamonds' massive light so long ago. They're able to temporarily help the corrupted gems, but need White Diamond's help as well to make the change permanent. Oh yeah, remember White Diamond? Uh, she's still alive and kicking. She shut herself away after Pink's shattering, but it seems like we're finally gonna see what she's been up to. Steven, the Crystal Gems, and the Diamonds travel to Homeworld and are greeted by a massive welcome home ceremony for Pink. Steven is taken by an ominous cracked white pearl to meet White Diamond, whose presence is... Uh, unnerving. White treats Steven like he's still Pink Diamond and as if she's only been away for a few months after throwing a temper tantrum. She promptly sends him to Pink's palace. White Diamond sends her pearl to announce that Era 3 has begun during a lavish ball. But but when the Diamonds, as well as White through her pearl, discover the blasphemy that is Stevani and Garnet, who inspire a bunch of other random gems to start fusing and disrupting the social order, the Diamonds poof a bunch of gems and trap Stevani in a prison. Steven's able to contact a Watermelon Steven back home to tell Bismuth, Greg, Peridot, and Lapis that they need help. Blue and Yellow come around to Steven's side and stand up to White, helping Steven in his attempt to convince her that Earth is worth saving. White isn't into this idea, though, and fights back. Luckily,
Luckily, Bismuth, Peridot, and Lapis show up in the nick of time to help. It's too little too late, though, as White possesses both yellow and blue, putting them out of commission. She does the same to Garnet, Amethyst, and Pearl, and traps Connie, separating her from Steven. With Steven all to herself, White rips out his gemstone, hoping to get Pink to shed that weird, awkward human form and return to normal, because again, gems don't really know how humans work, let alone Steven. Instead, a Pink Steven is created, who uses his outside voice to say that Pink Diamond is gone for good, and then fuses back with human Steven into 100% good old Steven Universe. Steven finally internalizes the idea that he isn't Pink Diamond or Rose Quartz, he's always just been himself. White Diamond begrudgingly admits defeat and releases the gems. Steven confronts his... Grandma? Aunt? I guess? And accepts her for her flaws. He also helps her to accept her own flaws, knowing that he can get her to change her mind on things over time. With his family problems resolved, Stephen, Connie, the Crystal Gems, and the Diamonds return to Earth, uncorrupt the gems, and live happily ever after. Except not really, because... The movie, around 16 AS or 2016. Two years after the conclusion of the original series, Stephen grows a neck and establishes peace across the universe, in that order. Stephen announces to all the gems that he's dismantled the Empire, supposedly installing democracy instead, and is going to live back on Earth with his friends. The Diamonds, being the weird, clingy pseudo-aunts that they are, beg Steven to stay, but Steven turns them down. Back on Earth, Steven and Connie are finally dating. After a little kiss on the cheek, Steven sees Connie off to space camp for the summer, and then sings about how awesome life is. Would Connie really learn much from space camp if she's already been to other planets and is friends with a bunch of aliens? Tell everyone in space camp that space used to be super scary and dangerous, but it's great now! I win! But wouldn't you know it, right when Steven's song ends, life stops being awesome. A massive drill lands in Beach City, and the Crystal Gems are greeted by a very angry and very different looking Spinel. She announces her plans to kill Steven along with all life on Earth, as the drill begins injecting a weird liquid into the ground. Using a wicked scythe in one swoop, Spinel manages to poof Garnet, Amethyst, and Pearl, and even slices into Steven, but it has no apparent effect on him. Steven manages to use the scythe against Spinel, and poofs her in return. At the Beach House, Steven and Greg wait for the gems to regenerate, but when they do, they find that they've reverted to their original forms, losing all of their memories in the process. When Spinel reforms, she too has been reverted to her original, carefree, goofy self. You're not mad? Mad? Why would I be mad at my best friend? <laughs> she clings to Steven, wanting to follow and entertain him on his quest to get the gems back to normal. At Little Homeworld, the colony for gems on Earth where the barn once stood, Bismuth explains to Steven that the scythe that Spinel used was a rejuvenator, a device that was meant to keep gems in their place by resetting them. Steven realizes that although he didn't lose his memories or character development, the rejuvenator caused his gem powers to reset back to the basics, which is basically nothing. I can't store things in Lion's Mane now! That's like the easiest thing I do! Spinel suggests that reverting the crystal gems back to normal might be a matter of just reminding them of who they are. So Steven sets out to do just that, through song, and super accelerated because we don't have time to go through the whole series again. He manages to get Ruby and Sapphire to fuse again, but they still don't remember who they are. Luckily, Steven's funny handshake with Amethyst does enough to jog her memory, making her the first gem to return back to normal. As the plant life around Beach City begins to deteriorate, Steven, Greg, and Amethyst bring Pearl to Steven's friend Sadie's concert, hoping to ignite the spirit of rebellion in her. When Steven and Greg fuse to form Steg, Pearl finally remembers who she is. As her memories return, Pearl tells Steven about who Spinel is. Spinel's memory is given a kick of its own during Steg's fusion, as she saw Steven disappear before her eyes, reminding her not so pleasantly of Pink Diamond's abandonment of her. While Pearl exposits to an exhausted Steven, Spinel runs off. Spinel takes Steven through the galaxy warp to the garden, where she and Pink used to play. She tells her side of the story as her memories begin to return. Steven tells her that Pink was wrong to treat her that that way and that she just needs to find someone who treats her better. Pink Diamond actually kind of sucked. Like, she had lofty goals and, and her, her cause was great, but as a person she was kind of terrible. Don't at me. Actually, yes, do at me. Back on Earth, Spinel agrees to turn off the drill. However, when Steven, in fixer mode, immediately shifts his attention to everyone else, Spinel becomes unhinged and accuses him of using her and planning to toss her away once she's done. She even accuses him of planning to intentionally erase her memory with the rejuvenator, which he was holding on to. Spinel switches the drill back on and attacks Steven. While Steven tries to explain his frustration to Spinel, Garnet recovers her memory and helps the citizens of Beach City escape to a safe place. When Steven realizes that his desire for a perfect, unchanging future has been holding him back, he regains his gem powers and fights Spinel head on. The battle destroys the drill and Spinel realizes that hurting Steven isn't gonna fix anything. Then the diamonds arrive and decide to finally be helpful. 
Marvel. They pop in for a surprise visit, announcing their plans to live on Earth with Steven. Instead, he introduces them to Spinel, and they immediately fall in love with her as she reminds them of Pink Diamond. And, you know, she's a nice reminder of Steven as well. So instead of living on Earth, they take in Spinel, and Steven and his friends begin repairing Beach City. Everything is A-OK! -okay. Well, uh, except Steven's constant exposure to uh, mental trauma, but I'm sure that won't come back to haunt him. Steven Universe Future! 16 AS to 17 AS, or 2017. It's been a few months since Spinel attacked Beach City, and life has returned to normal, or at least it's found a new kind of normal. Lars has opened his own bakery, Sadie Killer and the suspects have gone on tour, and Connie has begun her stint as the new lo-fi hip-hop studying girl. Oh, also she's applying for colleges. Meanwhile, Steven has opened up Little Homeschool, a place where gems from all across the universe can come together to live peacefully and find some new purpose in this new era. Most gems are happy to take advantage of the opportunity, but there's one who refuses to take any part in it. Jasper's been living on the outskirts of Beach City, destroying any Earthling who comes near her cave. Steven tries to convince her to visit the school, but things escalate into an argument and then a full-blown fight. During the fight, Steven's skin turns pink and he unleashes a devastating attack, which actually kind of impresses Jasper. Steven apologizes and asks Jasper if she can train him. She refuses, but doesn't tell Steven to never come back or anything, so, you know, baby steps. Later, Steven tries to help some gems get jobs, but things go south. Steven wonders if his ability to help others is fading. He's thrown another curveball when he comes across newly reformed Rose Quartzes. Steven attempts to get to know these gems, but is haunted by the image of his mother. Doesn't help that one of them looks literally exactly like Pink Diamond's Rose form. Steven and the Rose Quartzes come to an understanding and realize that they're sort of like siblings. Even so, this event causes Steven even more stress. Still feeling like he can't help anyone anymore, he tries to assist the gem who's still wounded, Pink Pearl, who will be known later as Volleyball. When Steven learns that it was Pink Diamond and not White that gave Volleyball her cracked eye, his stress mounts and he becomes pink once again for a moment. Together with regular Pearl, they travel to a place called The Reef, a structure used for Pearl creation and maintenance. However, Volleyball's crack can't be fixed, as it's a psychological crack and not a physical one. She reveals that Pink Diamond lashed out after being told that she couldn't have a colony and took her anger out on her Pearl. Regular Pearl won't take this kind of slander about the Pink Diamond that she fell in love with and begins arguing with Volleyball. Steven gets angry hearing about all the awful things Pink did and turns pink himself once more, causing the Reef to misread his discomfort as anger towards the two pearls that are accompanying him, trapping them and setting them for rejuvenation. The two pearls fuse into Mega Pearl to escape and safely get Steven out of there to turn off the automated system. Volleyball heals emotionally, but we're still not sure if her eye ever got fixed. Psychological scars and all, you know? Afterwards, Steven encounters an evil fusion of Aquamarine and the Ruby with a gem for an eyeball that he's crossed paths with before named Bluebird Azurite, who hopes to get revenge on him. Aquamarine and Eyeball Ruby fail and run off to who knows where. Tragically, Greg loses his long hair in the process. Some standard Steven and the Gems goofing off ensues until one day he and Lapis head off to an alien planet to investigate rumors of a pair of Gems who are still destroying worlds. The two of them turn out to be a pair of Lapis Lazuli and are completely unwilling to change their ways. Steven and Lapis try to show them the beauty of the natural world through song, dance, nature, y you know, the standard Steven treatment, but it just doesn't get through to them. <laughs> They're not gonna sing and dance. Who do these two randos think they are? Pearls? Steven and Lapis begin to think that these two are a lost cause, but one of the Lapises actually does end up following them to Little Homeschool, so not all is lost. As graduation approaches at Little Homeschool, Steven goes to pick up a cake from Lars's bakery. Sadie shows up and reveals that she has a new romantic partner named Shep, much to Steven's dismay. Having shipped Lars and Sadie his whole life, he's determined to have Lars chase after her, even though Lars himself stated that he's fine with Sadie's new relationship. In fact, he tells him that since the off-colors are finished with school, they're gonna head back into space. That night at the graduation party, Steven also learns that Sadie Killer and the suspects have broken up and are going their separate ways. Terrified by all this change, Steven turns pink once again, accidentally creating a diamond barrier, sealing himself and his friends inside. The barrier gets smaller and smaller, threatening to suffocate them all. Steven lashes out and blames Lars for not talking to Sadie, who then reveals that they did talk, but had grown too far apart and decided not to get together. Mr. Open the chest during the time skip. Can't deal with character development when it happens off screen, but thanks to a pep talk from Shep, a Shep talk, he realizes that things are changing and his friends are moving on, but they'll always be his friends no matter what. The barrier disappears and Steven bids farewell to his friends. With most of his friends gone, Steven takes up gardening and accidentally creates life once again, this time in the form of Cactus Steven. Steven vents to his new Cactus friend about how all the crystal gems have been getting on his nerves recently, and, well, Cactus Steven keeps growing and eventually becomes a massive beast that mirrors everything Steven says, including his bad-mouthing of the gems. I don't want any more Highland 
mighty advice from Garnet. Uh, they're able to resolve the issue with Cactus Steven, but not the real Steven who started bottling up his feelings, a very healthy habit. Thanks to all those feelings, Steven starts having horrible nightmares which somehow interfere with TV signals. Using this phenomenon as a way to fix the abysmal reboot of their favorite show, Steven and Peridot dream up new episodes and tape them, but this starts to really affect Steven negatively since he becomes so overwhelmed with fixing the episodes when all he really wanted to do was hang out with Peridot. Steven's not even sure he knows how to live without having some grand problem to fix, but he's absolutely exhausted. Peridot sees Steven's breakdown in his dream and they cancel the rest of their episodes, opting instead to just enjoy each other's company. A few days later, Steven, Pearl, Bismuth, and Connie head to the Starlight Roller Rink for a night of fun. While there, they encounter some of Connie's friends from school, leaving Steven feeling left out and like he's forgotten how to talk to humans. Steven and Bismuth end up sitting on the sidelines as Steven laments about how out of place he feels. Bismuth empathizes and admits she only really came to hang out with Pearl, who seems to already have a whole new life outside of Little Home School. Bismuth gives him a pep talk of her own and convinces Steven to go skate with Connie. The two fuse into Stevani and clean up at the roller rink's dance contest. However, despite the awesome night, Steven can't help but feel like he's drifting away from Connie. As Connie's plans to head off to college start becoming more real, Steven turns pink once again and starts worrying. He asks the best couple he knows for advice, Garnet. Unfused, both Ruby and Sapphire encourage Steven to propose to Connie, cause, you know, that's a great idea for a 17 year old in the middle of an emotional crisis. Well. Well, Steven goes for it and plans an incredibly romantic date on the beach for them. He sings her a beautiful song and the night is going very well until he pops the question, which goes about as well as you'd expect. Connie's naturally shocked, but realizes how much effort Steven has put into this and recognizes the pain and heartache that Steven's been going through. She gently lets him down, not with a no, but with a not now, which respect to Connie, that's like the best way she could have handled this situation. Steven seems to take it well, but when she leaves, his emotions literally explode and Garnet does what she can to comfort him after Ruby and Sapphire gave him some uh, not so great advice. As the days pass, Steven falls deeper and deeper into depression. Any mention of Connie sends him into a panic. These panic attacks start growing. Literally, Steven's limbs grow erratically at the mention of anything Connie related, eventually leading to Connie taking him to the doctor for the first time in his life. Specifically, she takes him to her mom, Dr. Maheshwaran. The doctor shows on an x-ray that Steven suffered numerous fractures, particularly around his brain, and despite his miraculous recoveries through his healing powers, she believes that he suffered emotional trauma as a result of going through so much at a young age. Steven starts to recall his past, but he only gets up to the end of season one before Dr. Maheshwaran stops him and tells Steven that he is most definitely suffering from PTSD and that the stress is only unmanageable now because he feels his support system is failing him. Upon recalling the proposal, Steven grows to an enormous size. Luckily, Connie had already called Greg, who calls off his managing of Sadie and Shep on their new tour to go console his son. Now back home and taking care of Steven full time, Greg takes him out on a road trip to give him some new perspective on life. They stop by Greg's childhood home to sneak in and grab an old CD. At first, Steven is excited to learn more about his father's childhood, but it soon turns sour when he realizes that his father willingly gave up normalcy when that's all Steven wanted growing up. It gets even worse when Steven realizes that he took their last name from a song. He turns pink once again, claiming that Greg is just as bad as Pink Diamond for stowing away his perfectly normal upbringing. In his rage, Steven tears the steering wheel off the van and crashes it. Luckily, they're safe, but it's obvious that Steven has lost a lot of respect for his dad, despite his father's attempts to reassure him. Back home, Steven is lectured by the gems for his outburst. Steven uses his new favorite move, glow pink and run away. It's super effective, slowing down time, allowing him to run at super speed. He goes to the one place that nobody would look for him, Jasper's cave. Steven begins training with Jasper to learn to control his powers. Steven's form gets pinker and more ripped, when it comes time for a rematch with Jasper, Steven goes all out, showcasing some lovely diamond pupils and shattering Jasper. Absolutely devastated, he runs home as fast as he can and dumps Jasper's shards into the bathtub. He uses the remaining diamond aura potions to bring her back. Now reformed, Jasper bows to Steven, calling him my diamond, much to his horror. Terrified of who he is, Steven runs off to the galaxy warp to find the only people who can help him, the diamonds. On Homeworld, he encounters Spinel, who is in a much healthier place now. How have you been? since uh since i tried to kill you <laughs> that was so embarrassing they go to see yellow diamond about his growing problems but it's no use so they go to blue diamond to see if she can help his emotional problems with happy drug clouds but sadly it's shallow comfort as steven realizes this doesn't actually help his problem in the long term lastly they visit white diamond to see if she can fix his self-esteem problems white has created a new power allowing gems to channel 
resolve themselves through her so she can see who they really are, basically a reversal of what she did before. She suggests Steven use her ability to try to speak to himself. Instead, Steven remembers what she did to him in the past and his anger takes over, causing himself to inflict pain on her while he's in possession of her body. Horrified by what he's done, again, he runs away, swelling and glowing pink all the way home. Back home, Steven decides to do the healthy thing and bottle everything up and pretend like nothing's wrong. That shouldn't be a problem, right? Everyone says they're worried about him, but he keeps insisting that everything is fine and he just needs to keep doing what he does best, helping people, whether they need it or not. Eventually, Steven's friends confront him and urge him to seek help, but Steven swells more and more and finally admits that he's a monster. Or at least that's how he sees himself. He swells more, morphing into a monstrous form. He loses control of himself and attacks Beach City. Bismuth, Lapis, and Peridot do their best to fend him off while Garnet, Amethyst, and Pearl fuse into Alexandrite. Lapis restrains Steven in a whirlpool, but she can't hold him for long. Suddenly, the Diamonds and Spinel arrive to check on Steven, perfect timing as usual. After learning that the monster everyone is preoccupied with is Steven, they help hold him down, or at least try to. Even the Cluster emerges to restrain him. The Diamonds and Spinel sob about how it's their fault Steven is like this, to which Connie says, yeah, it is. But even though it's their fault, grief and self-blame won't help Steven. They need to put Steven's feelings above their own, just as he's always done for everyone else. Garnet devises a plan. Instead of simply restraining Steven, everyone goes in for a hug, holding him back, but also comforting him, reminding him of all he's done for them. They tell him how much they love him and care for him, and how they want to help him overcome his problems. Connie seals the deal with a kiss on the forehead. Steven begins to tear up and returns to his human form. Surrounded by his friends and family, Steven sobs, releasing all of those bottled up feelings finally. Three months later, this show loves its time skips now, Steven is finally seeing a therapist. He's also decided to leave Beach City behind. He and Connie plan out his travel schedule while he begins making the rounds to say his goodbyes. After a tearful farewell to Bismuth, Lapis, and Peridot, Steven then gives Greg his old room. Even Jasper is upset about him leaving, but strangely, Garnet, Amethyst, and Pearl aren't. Even as he's getting in his car to leave, they don't seem to be sad. That is, until he drives back and demands to know why they're not upset with a very tactful What's wrong with you guys? Of course, they were holding back. Tears pour out of their eyes as they hold each other, tearfully saying goodbye. They reassure him that no matter what his future looks like, they will be a part of it. And so, Steven gets into his car and drives off, leaving Beach City behind, heading towards something new. He's finished discovering his gem side. Now it's time to be human. And that was Steven Universe, a story about a half-gem, half-human boy who went from singing about cat ice cream to liberating the entire galaxy. Thank you for watching the complete Steven Universe timeline. I've been Jacob. Be sure to subscribe for more videos like this one. And remember, Frederator loves you.